Hello. Welcome to the Alex webinar, Technical Services Skills for the Future. I'm Felicity Dykus, a member of the Continuing Education Committee, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Our presenter today is Lisa German. Lisa is the Dean of Libraries and Elizabeth Rockwell Chair at the University of Houston. She has held this position for just a little over a year. She'll be telling you a little bit more about herself, so I won't go into more detail here. There's a few things to keep in mind for today's webinar. All attendees are muted, so if you have questions or comments for Lisa, please type them into the question box on your screen, and she will answer them at the end of her presentation. Our software doesn't have interactive chat capabilities, but we do have an, a Twitter hashtag set up. It's A-L-C-T-S-C-E. We don't monitor that, so again, if you have questions or comments for Lisa, put them in the uh, question box. The webinar is being recorded, and you'll receive an email with links to the recording and presentation slides. And now, here's Lisa. There'll be a slight delay as we change presenters. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisa German, and I'm the Dean of Libraries and the Elizabeth D. Rockwell Chair at the University of Houston, where I've been the Dean now just over a year. Prior to coming to Houston, I was the Associate Dean of Collections and Information Access Services. My title changed several times over the course of 10 years at Penn State. And before that, I was an Associate Professor and Technical Services Division Coordinator at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I have a long history of technical services experience in a variety of positions, starting with my very first job in libraries where I worked as a serials check-in clerk in 1984 at UIUC, which is the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, um, as we were migrating from a card system to a computerized check-in system. I worked in acquisitions, binding, and circulation for nine years before becoming a librarian. For the last four and a half years, I've worked with Carol Diedrichs to review collections and technical services organizations and processes. So I've seen organizations big and small and up close. And I'm very heartened by what I see. And it is within that context of this experience that I speak with you today. One of my hopes and goals for today is that you feel a bit more positive about your role when you than when you registered for this webinar. Or at least you understand why I believe the skills that you can bring to the table are necessary and important. So today we're going to do the following. We're going to define technical services. We're going to discuss the changes in the landscape that have taken place in technical services in the last 15 years. We're going to discuss what traits and skills I believe it takes to make a successful employee in technical services, some about what the future holds, and then we'll have question time. I'm going to use the definition of technical services found in the online dictionary for library and information science. Author Joan Wrights defines technical services as library operations concerned with the acquisition, organization, physical processing, and maintenance of library collections. By this definition, and also using the sections of ALEX as an indicator or guide, I'm talking to you those of you who are doing the following work. Acquisitions, working with serials or continuing resources, cataloging and metadata creation, 
collection management, and preservation. And before we go any further, we're going to do a poll. We want to know where you work. What kind of work are you doing? So Felicity, I'm going to turn this over to you to handle the poll. So you should all be seeing what kind of work do you do in libraries and select one of the following. I know you're now looking at the poll. And I'm watching 37, okay, about half of you voted. About two-thirds. Three-quarters. Eighty percent. Give it another ten seconds or so. Okay, why don't we go ahead and we'll close the poll. And it looks like, and here are the poll results. Fabulous. 18% of you, you can, I hope you can see this, 18% of you um, do acquisitions work, about two-thirds metadata and cataloging. Um, some of you are working with collection management. Um, some of you um, with continuing resources, I imagine you're probably in, um, working in a unit that's either acquisitions or metadata and cataloging. And a few of you from preservation, so that's great. So, so wonderful. And some of you probably do a, con um, uh, a um, variety of these things. So let's talk about some of the, hmm. So let's talk about the definition of technical services, and we'll, um, I'm going to use a couple of examples from places that I found. So at the University of Illinois, they talk about the technical services division, where people are responsible for acquiring, organizing, preserving, and providing access to materials in all formats for the library's collections in support of the University of Illinois' library mission to enhance the university's activities in creating knowledge, preparing students for lives of impact, love that phrase, and addressing critical societal needs. I really like how on their webpage it describes technical services and it puts it in the context of the overall mission of the library because that's something we always have to remember. The University of Georgetown does that as well. Technical Services is responsible for the acquisition, access, metadata, and preservation of library materials in print and electronic formats to meet the research, teaching, and learning initiatives at Georgetown University. In your libraries, you may not call these functions by these names. For example, in my library, I have no technical services unit. I have an acquisitions department and a metadata and digitization department, or MDS, that perform most of these functions. Preservation work happens in both MDS and in special collections. That may be true in your library as well. Let's concentrate today on the functions and the work and not necessarily where they reside in your organization. Because if I've learned one thing, it's that all organizations are just a bit different and often unique to their own personnel and cultural situations. So let's spend a minute just talking about changes. 
Fifteen years ago, I was the head of acquisitions at the University of Illinois. We were organized in a fairly traditional way. Acquisitions had just moved or was in the process of moving. It was a long time ago, and I can't quite remember the dates. Into the basement of the library, near the mailroom, and the cataloging department was on the second floor. I'm not sure how many people we had in what was known as, and is still known as, the Technical Services Division. Fast forward 15 years, and I would place some of the changes that we've seen that are impacting technical services in one or more different buckets. We've had changes in technology, user needs and expectations, changes in the scholarly communications landscape, and increased competition for budget. I know all of these changes sound like I'm talking about things at the 50,000 foot level, but these changes are all impacting our universities and perhaps our cities and our towns, our constituencies, and our libraries. I have always believed that technical services are public services. So when our libraries are impacted, our technical services are impacted as well. I didn't list these in any particular order because I think they all have an impact. Changes in technology have brought profound changes to our libraries. Our library website is our virtual front door. We have moved from a place where our metadata is available for everyone for, to see in our library to now it's available for everyone everywhere. And it always was when we were, have been, since we've been using OCLC. But I think now we've moved to a much more linked data kind of environment. Virginia Skilling wrote a nice piece entitled Transforming Library Metadata into Linked Library Data. The development of the semantic web and having interoperable metadata was just a glimmer in someone's eye 15 years ago. I think as much as anything, this concept has changed the work of people in technical services. We harvest data upstream and we bring it downstream for our local use. This means a new way of thinking and perhaps a more expansive way. The other thing that changes in technology has brought is that we're all bringing those materials that we deem unique into the wider world through digitization. We're all digitizing many of our special collections, and meet, that means there is a huge need for descriptive metadata. It means we have to understand file sizes and types and what that means for user access. It brings with it the need to understand copyright, the rendering of an image or a set of images to be available to our users brings with it many more complexities than what when we're dealing, for example, with a print monograph. It is, however, a set of skills that people in technical services have or are able to acquire. Of course, the equipment with which we do our jobs has changed too, and you all know that better than I do. A huge percentage of our work is done using a computer. Software has changed and cloud computing is here. We have integrated library systems now that take advantage of solutions at scale and we're using technology created in our universities to create the biggest digital library in the world in HathiTrust and to create digital asset management systems for ourselves using software such as Fedora and Hydra. I think all of this is a fabulous learning experience for our technical services staff. Some people might see it as scary, but I really see it as exciting. 
you all know better than I the impact that the changes in user needs and expectations have had on technical services. Our libraries are open longer. There is a need for a more selective number of print materials in our libraries, and users want more technology, more group study rooms, and easier access to electronic resources. Technical services typically has two groups of users or stakeholders, if you will. The rest of the library and then all the patrons of the library. The library's stakeholders typically include such areas of, as special collections, interlibrary loan, and circulation. And liaison services, or the library's librarians who perform collection development functions. Several years ago, Sue Searing, who used to be the head of the Library and Information Science Library at the University of Illinois and went on to be their AUL of Public Services, said to me, I want it, and no matter what it was, I want it fast, right, and cheap. And if I can't have all three, I want it fast and right. I have never forgotten that because I think you can apply that notion to all sorts of settings. And I think that phrase is as true today as it was when she said it. Where once it took weeks for an order, for example, to be received, it can now be delivered to the user within 24 hours if there was an urgent need. And I know this because that happened just last week um, when I needed something and our acquisitions department was able to get it within 24 hours. Changes in technology around cataloging, cataloging in OCLC, bringing in records, no matter where you catalog. Uh, we do batch loading, um, we're using programs such as MarkEdit, and inventory controls and collections management are sometimes performed with iPads and with scanners. There have also been a big change in the scholarly communications landscape that have affected technical services. If your library is anything like mine, between 80 and 95 percent of your collections budget is spent on electronic resources. E-serials, e-books, audiobooks, streaming media, all of these comprise more and more of your time in technical services. However, in many libraries I see, 80 to 90 percent of the technical services staff isn't dealing with electronic re resources. Our staffing numbers around electronic resources in many cases are fewer than the number of staff that would deal with print. And as we talk about traits needed in the future, I really think this is going to have to change. And I think it's really unclear whether electronic resource management takes fewer people to manage than it does to manage print. It's complicated sometimes, and it's difficult. However, I do think the skills needed are evolving. Vendor consolidation brings its own kind of challenges. The more vendors, the easier it is to manage procurement. But the more risky and the decrease in competition is not uh, good for anyone. Just as we have fewer systems in the marketplace, we have fewer vendors too. I think we're all still trying to figure out what open access might mean for technical services. There are so many varieties of open access models. I'll be watching very closely the initiatives that are occurring in places like MIT where they're moving the collections budget into the scholarly communications budget. It's a different kind of model, and purchasing big commercial packages may be a piece of the scholarly communications landscape, and they're going to begin using their budget as a tool to affect change. 
I think there's more to come on this, and I'm going to continue to watch it and other scholarly communications unfold on the In the Open blog. There's also increased competition for money, and that presents a challenge for all of us, no matter what types of libraries we work in. Universities are experiencing declines in state funding, and that means belts are tightening. One thing that I asked my assessment librarian to do when I first got to Houston was to look at library expenditures as a percentage of the total university expenditures to see whether the library's expenditures had gone up or down in terms of percentage. I was glad to see that while the percentage of money funding we get from the university hadn't increased, it hadn't decreased either. Private schools are now recovering from decreased endowment revenues. Public schools are seeing bond referendums fail. And public libraries are seeing declines in municipal funding. All this means that we have to be as efficient with, with, as we can with what we have. Because the opt option of maintaining or of standing still, well, it's just not an option. We need to continue to innovate and move forward despite budgetary challenges. So people often ask me, from the perspective of being a dean, what do you think are the most valuable characteristics that it takes to be successful in technical services? Since I've said that I believe that technical service is a public service, that many of the characteristics listed below, or soon, um, will apply to people who either work in technical services, public service, wherever they're working in a library. I met over pizza, a pizza lunch, with many of our student employees last week. And they came from many different areas of the library. I wanted to make sure that each of them understood that they are working in a place on campus that is integral to the research enterprise. That we believe that libraries are places for people to learn, that access to information is a basic right for everyone. And I wanted them to just step back and think about that, what that means. It's really easy to get focused on the particular job that you're doing without sometimes you know, reflecting on the importance of what you're accomplishing. So one of the things I did in preparation for this webinar is I went to our head of metadata and digitization services, Annie Wu, very proud of Annie. She's one of the ARL leadership fellows this year, to ask her what skills were important to her when she's hiring new librarians and staff. Now, this particular slide is very cataloging centric, but some of these things could also apply to people working in acquisitions, collection management, electronic resources, and preservation. Annie mentioned these six skill necessary skills, resource description standards and tools, metadata schemas, and the willingness to learn them a rudimentary knowledge of programming languages, system functionality, file manipulation and batch processing, and project management. All of these things are happening in our metadata and digitization services unit by our librarians and staff right now. And as we increase our digitization initiatives, the need for people to be able to do these things is also going to increase. I also got the input of two of our newer librarians, Melody Condren and Lindsay Cronk, who are working in the areas of cataloging and collection management, because I wanted to see whether my thoughts were also their thoughts. And these two women are both our present and our future in technical services. So 
it's very hard for me to list any of these in order because I think they're all really important. So I'm just going to talk about a few of them. When I was thinking about flexibility, I was thinking about how many roles I had in, my, in the last job um, I had at Penn State before I became a dean. I don't mean just advancing, I mean assuming new roles. So when I got to Penn State, I began as the assistant dean for technical and collection services. Acquisitions and cataloging reported to me. A year later, I became responsible for information technology. A couple years later, my title changed to Associate Dean for Collections and Information and Access Services, and several other responsibilities came my way. Right before um, I left for Houston, I was going to have yet another set of responsibilities. And I believe no matter what your role is, I believe it's important to be flexible and to be willing to take on new and different responsibilities depending on the needs of your organization. I believe that the most successful people in our libraries are those folks who desire to learn. Lifelong learners are the kinds of folks and the trait that we need in technical services. We also need positive problem solvers. The other night, I'll, I'll, I'll confess to this, the other night I was watching How to Get Away with Murder. Annalise, the lead character, who's a lawyer, and played by Viola Davis, said to her associate Bonnie, you always come to me with problems, never with solutions. Well, we need problem solvers in technical services to devise solutions to thorny problems. And I have a feeling that all of you who are out there do much of that every day. The other thing we need is effective communicators. There's a staff member in cataloging at Penn State who has really missed his calling. He is a phenomenal teacher. He gave a talk, to, uh, talk on linked data that wowed all the librarians and taught us all so much, including his associate dean. Being able to do, um, to explain what you do in terms that others can understand and gain an appreciation of is so critical to working in a library. And I think it's critical in technical services as well. And librarianship, like many things in life, takes a team effort. Being able to be part of a team, to collaborate with your colleagues, is the way we need to work and the way that our students are currently working. So please look at this list. Are there any other traits that you think is important? So go ahead and type in what traits do you think are important to work in technical services. Felicity, where can people be typing this in? You can use that question box that we mentioned earlier and just, uh, oh good, people are starting to respond. Oh good. I'll read some of these. Sense of humor, perseverance, attention to detail, comfort with ambiguity, time management, curiosity, identifying the problems, personal initiative, more on creativity, intelligence, Patience, I really like that one too. Yep, 
at the ability to work on lengthy projects for long periods of time. It does seem there's more projects than in the past. I would agree with that. Adaptability. What do you think of this one? Yeah, living on quicksand. That goes yeah. back to what you were saying about the change. Yep. Seems like things are, are changing all the time. And what was the, what's the one on the bottom? Uh, oops, oh, here we go. Seeing things from, you can't see the... Different perspectives. Oh, thing. absolutely. Tech savvy, sense of humor again. Thinking on your feet and thinking outside the box. There is not a thing in there that I would disagree with. Oh, that's multitasking. <laughs> Well, that's true, too. I think that goes back when the poll, a couple people commented after the poll how they're doing multiple things from that list. And I think, and I think, that's, really, I think that's really true. Oftentimes, we're not just doing one thing. We're doing a wide variety of things, and it might depend on the size of the library, or it might depend on how you're organized. Great. Willing to le willingness to learn, absolutely. That whole willingness to learn new things is just really, really critical, I think. Fabulous. Thank you all for, for um, all, your, all your comments. So now let's talk about a little bit about what the future holds. So, and we, uh, we'll talk about that against the backdrop of all the traits that we've discussed. So what do I think the people in each of the specific areas of technical services are going to need that we outlined right at the beginning of the webinar? And managers, what are you looking for and what do you think the future holds? I think we will continue to acquire, so let's, we'll talk about acquisitions for a minute. I think we'll continue to acquire materials for our libraries, but the landscape could look different. We might be paying our faculties author page charges rather than paying subscription charges. We might have to keep track of how much we've paid for which faculty members. We might be combining that kind of model with our traditional subscription model. Regardless how and what we acquire, acquisitions personnel are still going to need to know how to manage a budget, have an understanding of the bibliographic records that represent the item being purchased, know how to talk, work with, and negotiate with vendors, understand contracts, be familiar with acquisitions models, and understand the audit rules in your organizations. If you're working with serials or continuing resources, life will continue to be full of surprises. You'll need to continue to analyze packages and understand systematic downloading problems that always seem to plague our systems, especially at the end of the semester. Troubleshooting access issues will continue to take up more and more of your time. So being able to solve problems and understand some of these different um, technological issues will continue to be vexing. But <clears throat> managing the um, continuing resources, I think, is where that concept of a team sport is really evident. For those of you in cataloging, I imagine much of your life will be data wrangling rather than doing individual cataloging. Except, uh, I'll give an exception pretty soon. The, rec the records we use to describe our mainstream collections will most likely come from other places. And you'll have to determine what's good enough for access by most likely establishing a profile and monitoring and managing that profile. More and more of your work will be focused on special and unique collections and in creating metadata for our digital collections. You may collaborate more with faculty on your campus 
or with others in the community to help them describe their collections and to give them guidance on establishing a schema for their metadata. Your skills are so important in this future world, and you've been doing this for years. People need you. I cannot tell you how many people would like to talk to our metadata librarian about how to describe their data. And as we transform our library spaces, the role of the collection manager becomes ever larger. We're moving large, and this, and this is where some of that project work comes in too. We're moving large quantities of materials maybe off-site, or we're taking actions based upon an identified retention policy. Excellent project management and workflow analysis skills are going to be paramount. I had a taste of this at Penn State when we began digitizing our materials with Google. We had a fabulous person on the ground who was managing the project day to day and figuring out the workflows and the ways in which um, she could support her team and the ways in which the workflow could be as efficient as possible because we were on such a tight time frame. Those of us who work in preservation are going to be creating digital preservation policies for our library. And we'll have to have a good knowledge of the global preservation initiatives, such as the Digital Public Library of America, Hathi Trust, and the Digital Preservation Network. In the face of declining budgets, prioritization is key to preservation policies. What needs conservation treatment? What do we stop treating? Um, doing less and less binding is a good example. And when is digitization the preservation answer? So what advice do I have for you? I suggest that you figure out how to demonstrate your impact. We're all having to do this. With, and without you, your, the electronic journals wouldn't be accessible. Without you, our budgets wouldn't be expended. Without you, you wouldn't be able to find any of our materials. I would, I, I would wager to say that you have a huge impact on the organization, not just the library, but on the scholarship, the teaching, and the research um, needs of your students that you don't always think about. I also suggest that you manage your workflows as efficiently as possible. I sometimes see two scenarios. Either the people on the ground doing the work know what's the most efficient way to do something and they can't get their manager's attention, or managers have ideas about how things could be more efficient, but they can't get their staff to do it. I think it really takes a village to create efficient workflows, but in the environment of declining resources, or even if there wasn't, you really don't have a choice. Big tents and big tables are needed. Better decisions are made when you involve everyone in the process. I just created a team to examine the workflows in our technical services area here at the University of Houston. And it includes someone from acquisitions, metadata and digitization, resource and discovery, collection management, and interlibrary loan. And try to remember that it's, a, it's about the work and always question things. If you don't understand something, Chances are, other people don't understand why they're doing it that way either. I've seen many libraries in my now 23 years of being a librarian, and I really think you've got this. This is an exciting time to work in libraries, and an exciting time especially to work in technical services. So I really thank you very much for letting me speak to you for 40 minutes now today. And please let me know 
if you have any questions. Thank you, Lisa. That was a, a great overview. And again, you know, there we have time for questions and comments. And everyone here has different experiences, so it would be interesting to hear what other people have to say. But Lisa, let me throw out a question to start with. So you mentioned at the beginning that some of the functions are the same, though they're they're maybe called different things. My question is, does technical services as a unit still have an identity? And, and what should be encompassed in, in that, that unit or identity? So that's, you know, whenever people are trying to think about an answer, they always say, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, I don't know if technical services per se, those particular words have an identity. I think what has an identity is the, the work that you're performing. So where, whereas, you know, you can think about, or we'll put it another way, you're thinking, you know, if you think about technical services and all the component parts of it, then I think you certainly do have an identity, but I'm not sure it's called technical services. Certainly here I don't think um, the folks who work in acquisitions and metadata and digitization services necessarily think of, they don't have that technical services identity because we don't use that term, but they're performing the work. Um, so I guess that's how I, I would, I would um, answer that question. I think it really depends on um, the library in which you work. Thanks okay. for that. Someone has commented that they renamed their department Resources Management Services to better represent the type of work they do. Resources Management Services. That's re that's really interesting, and I that that is that is very descriptive of what folks do. I'm in. In what I'm guessing is a yeah I I I'd be interested in knowing what the unit was before. Mm -hmm. um, I know some people um, also have renamed their units content management services because really they're all about managing content, just a different word for resources. Okay, here's another question. Is there room for advancement of technical services librarians based on technical skills rather than management? I think so, but it might be in a different area than when, you know, than, than you might be traditionally thinking. So if you have, so, so let's, I'm going to take my, um, I'm going to take my head of, um, Metadata and Digitization Services. Um, used to, department used to be called Cataloging. Changed the changed the department name because it was um, it it expanded and broadened in in scope. Um, she has some pretty pretty fabulous technical skills, um, and she also understands how systems work. Now I don't want her to leave, so um, I hope there are not any directors on here. Um, but I would say that she could go on to be an associate dean either in, um, uh, in you know, some area that encompasses what are traditional technical services areas. But she might be a really good um, example of someone who could move into IT. And that's the other thing. I've seen um, people who have really great technical skills and do you move into um, some sort of either scholarly communications or IT arena. Um, so I think there is I think there is room for growth, especially for people who who have really good technology skills. I also think that there's you know that's a fabulous skill to have because oftentimes those folks with good technology skills are also systems thinkers. And I, and I think that it's really important for associate deans right now, no matter what their um, job may entail, to be those um, kind of system thinkers. 
-hmm. Here's some okay. other names that are being used. Resource, acquisition, management, and discovery. And one that's close to what you mentioned, content management, with the catalogers being called metadata services technicians and librarians. And in answer to what you commented before, the previous name on one of these was technical systems. Technical systems, interesting. So do you have advice based on how to gain some of those skills? There's a particular question here about the metadata skills and experience. If a person isn't working in a library that uses some of that technology or software. So for people who want to move forward, how can they get those skills when they're not currently part of the, the job? Um, so there's a couple of, I have a couple of different um, answers to that. Um, sometimes, so I didn't actually know how to catalog. Um, I came up through technical services, through the acquisition side of the house. Um, and cataloging wasn't um, something that I knew how to do. Uh, so I volunteered at uh, my daughter's middle school and reclassified um, some of, the, some of the materials because they wanted them classified in Dewey. So that was a very, I mean, that was a very basic kind of um, uh, project, but it did help me get a better understanding of cataloging because I had to look at mark records, I had to make a choice, um, I had to decide what, what the material was about. So I, I felt like that volunteer um, activity was really helpful. So that might be one, um, one suggestion I would have. Uh, typically, and it wouldn't have to be at a university either. Um, you might um, check with an art museum or, um, or a school library or, um, you know, any, any kind of um, organization that's using, that's using metadata. Um, you also might um, belong to a particular organization um, and volunteer to help them to organize their papers. Um, and think about the different kind of meta schema you might use if you were doing that. Um, so that, that might be one, those are a couple of different examples. And I don't know whether um, people have access to this, uh, but we don't actually have access to it at the University of Houston, but uh, when I was at Penn State, we had access to uh, lynda.com. And there are a lot of um, uh, really good, um, there's a lot of good information in that. Um, and it's really a fabulous resource for learning new things. And so you might try to see if, if you do have access to something like that um, to try to take a, a little short course. Uh, the other thing you might do is um, get affiliated with a uh, what an iSchool or what's hardly ever called anymore a library school um, and see if there's a way that you could volunteer there so uh, or take a class um, I think I think it goes back to the whole issue of lifelong learning um, and volunteerism and both of those both of those areas and both of those ways I think you can I think you can um, really improve your skills Great. What is the, the one you mentioned, Linda? Was it lynda.com? How yeah, is that spelled? Yeah, L-Y-N-D-A dot com. L-Y-N. Okay. Great. Okay. Here's a um, two-part uh, question. Felicity, that, hold on yes. just a sec. Um, the, the, the other thing I might suggest is um, some places have access to uh, Safari. Um, so you might look there. Um, I would start out, you know, I would start out um, I'll confess, uh, either using Google Scholar or going to uh, library literature and um, doing a lit search and seeing what kind of information is out there. Great. Okay, two-part question. As a dean, when you're developing or, or adding a new um, sort of capability or skills or service, how do you decide whether to put it into a new unit or to rework a current unit or department? So like you're going to take on more scholarly communication stuff and digitization. And the second part of that is you're, if you're a 
department manager, say like in cataloging, and would like to assume some of those duties, how would you recommend that those department heads advocate for taking on these new things? Say digitization and the cataloging that goes with it. So how, when would you just make a whole new division, and when do you, as a dean, decide to work it into current units? That's a that's a that's a great question too. I think part of it depends on the strategic priorities of your of um, of your library. So here we've developed a new scholarly communications unit, which is separate from liaison services, which is where the bulk of we have a lot of librarians and liaison services because our librarians are very much embedded in the um, uh, in the departments that they that they work with. Um, so we set up a separate unit, but the the head of that, and we have we don't call him that, but the head of that works really closely with folks in liaison services and special collections in um, uh, metadata and digitization services. And so it's much more of a it's a much more of a team kind of a team environment. And the reason we we did it just very pragmatically was because liaison services was just so big. Um, so we thought that um, we would we would pull that out and then have him work with folks who are in all of those units and also have a couple of units uh, a couple of positions reporting to. Him. Um, to answer the second the second part of your question, um, I don't know who I, I wasn't paying attention to who asked it, but boy, that is a gift to your to your dean or your associate dean. Um, I love department heads who say, "I can do this, we can do this, let let us do this." So that's um, that actually happened here before I was uh, the. Uh, before I was the dean, kind of right before I was the dean, with digitization service. That didn't, you know, you don't always see a metadata, uh, you know, I think it was used to be called cataloging and metadata services. Um, you don't often see that department then um, uh, have digitization as a part of it. But because the head of that unit was a really good manager, and because she wanted to do it, uh, we said, sh absolutely. Um, we had a need, um, and we um, asked her to assume the need. She actually came to us and said, can we, you know, we have the capacity, we can do this. So I think it, I, I, I would encourage people, especially if you're a manager, to talk to the person that's a, um, whoever's your supervisor, because it's been my experience that I hardly ever turn down people who volunteer to help. Um, you know, it's it's just it's a great learning experience for them. Uh, it's filling a need for the organization. It really is a win-win um, kind of situation all the way around. So you know, hats off to you. That's great. Okay. Do you have suggestions for people who I have um, undergone multiple changes and they're being asked to go through more changes and for supervisors who have to continually say, okay, now we're not doing DDA this year, instead we're doing this. So how, how do you help people continue to, to cope with change? So that really goes to the shifting sands question, doesn't it? I mean, that goes to that comment that somebody mentioned. It feels like the sands are always shifting. And I guess what I'd say is that our, our, sand, our sands are always shifting in our organizations. Um, and sometimes they're because of emergencies that crop up, or sometimes because you get a new dean and they write it and they want a new strategic plan and they have a new strategic vision. Um, and, and so it could be a, for a variety of different ways. I have a great example now. Um, last week, all of a sudden in the dorms, um, people were noticing that the water was discolored. Um, so the, the entire university said, don't drink the water. Um, a store in town, managed, uh, 
donated pallets and pallets and pallets of water to our students. Uh, it went on for, uh, I bought water um, for our staff because, you know, it's, it's, it's expensive. Um, and uh, a day and a half later, the water, you know, the water, they flushed all the water, the water was fine. Um, but I'm sure that the president of the university didn't think she was going to have to deal with um, uh, a water, a, a water emergency. Um, so emergencies are going to come up, and you and you have to deal with them. And other things will come up, such as um, uh, you know when you talk about changing strategic priorities, um, you know that's going to happen too. You, we just underwent um, a strategic planning initiative. Uh, we have four strategic planning goals, uh, and and so the whole um, library is in the process of you know, aligning their departmental goals with the goals of the strategic plan. Um, and then um, people are aligning their individual goals to their department goals to the strategic plan. Um, I, I guess what I would say is, is it's really important to have that, that vision and those, those goals for the library. And then once you, once you establish those, then you can kind of figure out um, uh, where what you do uh, fits with those goals. I, you know, most every, people are seeing themselves in the goals, which makes me um, uh, really happy. Uh, I was at an um, open house for the Metadata and Digitization Services Unit last week, and you know, I, they, what they're doing, I mean, they ought to be able to see themselves all over these goals. Um, and so I guess I would say, you know, ch change is kind of, it, we're all, it's constant, um, but but I think if you have some kind of institu you know institutional alignment with your with what your you know what your goals of the um, the library are, uh, it makes it a little bit easier. I think um, the other thing I I can't stress enough is the importance of that middle management layer to talk. Um, I often see this in organizations where, you know, people have are either territorial of their their own unit, or they just don't have the um, mechanisms to have good conversation uh, with outside their unit, but at the same level. And I just think that is so so important, and that can really um, that can really help manage the change process if you have some really good communications pathways. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. We're winding down on our time here. Uh, what, what I really got from that is the importance of the technical skills, and not only that, but how much important people skills are these days. Oh, my gosh. Oh. That is very true. Uh, let's end with one quick question here that just came in. When and why do you use open houses like the one you mentioned? So you mentioned that your cataloging yeah. and metadata department had an yeah. open house. They did. Um, so a couple of our um, units have had, so I have a couple of different, um, uh, it was great. So they had, uh, they had different games um, that really talked about should, sort of what do they do. So they had a, a bingo so people could guess how many, how many digitized things they um, made accessible and how many uh, books they cataloged last year and they had a bunch of different numbers and you could, um, you could pick, your, pick, your, um, pick your box. Um, I picked, of course, the highest box, figuring that was the most um, politically correct thing to do. Um, and it was, um, it was great. I learned about, you know, the kinds of materials that they were cataloging, the kinds of stuff they were digitizing. They had tours of the digitization um, facility. It was just wonderful. And they do, they, um, Different units do it um, at different times in the year, and not all units have an open house. Uh, when I first got here, Acquisitions did one, um, and then Information and Access Services did an open house, so we learned more about infra, um, interlibrary loan and the classes that people taught. At, at Penn State, um, Ann Snowman, who's the um, head of Access Services, uh, was the founder of Discovery Day. And that's a day when it's now like part part of the day when uh, folks in the library go from unit to unit 
And so they have like a, one great big open house for any unit that wants to participate. And you get to learn about that unit. And you also might be able to take classes on, um, that's where actually I learned how to knit. Um, so it's, it's you know, di different libraries are doing things in a different way. Uh, but it's a way for people who may not know about what's going on in a particular unit um, to find out more and to have a good appreciation then of the work that their colleagues are doing. Great. Well, thank you. Um, this has been really useful and interesting. So everyone, I'm, I'm glad you could all be with us today. And you will soon receive a short online evaluation form. And the Continuing Education Committee would appreciate your responding to that. Your comments are valuable and help us plan future events. And I want to thank some people, especially Lisa German, for agreeing to do this webinar for us. Also, the ELEX Continuing Education Committee provides people that help us behind the scenes. Today it was Catherine Balick and Mary Acock, and Megan Doherty from the ELEX office helps pull everything together. Well, thank you so much. It was um, it was a pleasure, and I hope all of you had um, got to learn at least one thing today. And I hope you I hope you uh, leave the webinar feeling um, really good about the work that you're doing uh, because you are doing really good work. Great. And let me tell everyone about some events that are coming up. So we still have additional webinars this fall. This week we have one on the faceted application of subject terminology. And then in October and November we have a six-part series, and this is very future-oriented, from Mark to Bibframe. So those will have different speakers talking about different pieces of updating our Mark and making it available in Bibframe. In November we have a webinar on budget transparency, and in December Research data management, another new thing that's up in technical services in some areas. Alex also offers web courses and e-forums. And I encourage you to go to the Alex website to find out more information on any of those. So that concludes our session for today. Thank you for joining us.